company, they rationally come to the decision and say, well, look, you're making enough money to support the family for right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my time and to raise our children since yeah. I'm making money. And what happens is they'll do that, and women will notice that they're spending all this time at work. And, and you know, because I said women are inherently more maternal than men, than men, paternal than men are. And what happens is, is they'll come home from a long day of work and they'll see a man just having fun with the children. He's happy. He's smiling and stuff like that. And they get blistering mad because they see that is more of a wrong than the opposite. Yeah, that does lead to more divorce. Um, but uh, but either way, like every wage gap argument is a is a cliche, right? Uh, being afraid of strong, independent women. That's a cliche. There's no point to it. It's not a real claim. Um, and and like the the abortion argument, a woman has a right to do what she wants with her own body. That is a cliche argument. And it's a cliche because it's been made over and over and over again. And it's been wrongly accepted by society as an argument with valid premises. Um, the fear for it, being afraid of a strong, independent woman um, argument does not have valid premises in the same way that the own body argument uh, in abortion does not have valid premises because it ignores the fetus as a uh, as a separate body. Um, the the strong, independent woman argument relies on ignoring that the woman is demanding that all of male society rise up and give her at the expense of male society, uh, uh, the surrounding men, a um, a concession or a benefit that she did not earn in order to remedy an alleged uh, wrongdoing and that, that she considers to be gender-based. How well, is that independent? Yeah, well, I mean, just think or about strong. this. Yeah, well, just think about this, Hannah. What it really says is that in order for women to be equal to men, they have to be just as capable of giving birth as men. Well, here's the the thing about the the strong independent woman argument with respect to the wage gap, though. Um, they're arguing that in order for women to be equal to men, men have to pick women up and carry them. Which is sort of like the the argument that I often hear from you know people that support affirmative action. They say, well, white people have to come up together and they have to hold black people's hands in order to get them across this finish line. I'm like, to me, that's more debasing than slavery. Yeah, yeah because it's a statement that black people are not capable of getting across that line themselves. I make a joke. Yeah. I make a joke with my black friend about that. I said, because he also hates that as well. He's not even particularly conservative. He, he hates that. And I say, well, you know, I told him, I joked with him. I said, well, you know, well, man, you know, black man, if if I don't speak up for you, who will? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if I, as a white man, don't speak up for you, who will? You can't do that by yourself. That is pretty much the underlying argument of uh, of the entire left. Well, I mean, another funny thing that people don't consider is that they dishonestly, when it comes to now, obviously, slavery is wrong, no matter what. That does it need to be explained. Yeah. But the I, people often confuse this. They often say, oh, well, you're saying slavery is right. No, there's a difference between the morality of slavery and the content of slavery. Um, there's a difference. Yeah. And what I've always said is that like, they dishonestly, you know, what they'll do is they'll point to rich southern white people and there's the slaves. And they'll say, well, that's the entire, the only metric we need to look at and compare to see the disparity i'm like uh that's stupid they don't know this most of them don't know this but there were black slave owners oh yeah that and but here's another there were also black landowners that had um that, that were um that had sharecroppers that were black and some sharecroppers that were white so yeah. it's it's kind of it's kind of tough for them to make that argument stick um, well, but in in terms of their argument, like they're comparing women's situation to slavery, there's a real fine, uh, finite underlying limiter in comparing a woman's situation to slavery. And that is this. 
a woman can change what she's doing and not get punished for it by by not get rightfully punished for it right if a woman decides to leave her family and her husband threatens her with punishment for that he is in violation of the law he's considered an abuser our society does not condone his actions he can be put in jail he can even be executed if he uh, murders her for leaving right and she can keep him in the marriage uh, under threat of taking half of everything he owns but refuse to um, engage with him and, and, and treat him as a person at all. She doesn't have to do anything he says. She doesn't have to sit with him and talk. She doesn't have to have sex with him. She doesn't have to eat with him, cook for him, um, talk, you know, anything. She doesn't even have to really contribute to the household bills. There's not a law that makes her contribute her labor in any way, shape, or form to the household. Whereas a slave can't tell the master no about anything. Mm -hmm. And the master can do anything the master wants to the slave. Yeah. And well, I... there is no law that says you're a bad master and we're going to punish you if you physically abuse the slave, if you make the slave do something the slave doesn't want to do, if you refuse the slave the right to leave the arrangement or anything. None of that. So the comparison between women and slaves is so egregiously false and so egregiously um, insensitive to the actual plight of a slave as as to be embarrassing. It's it's mortifying every time feminists use that argument. Yeah, and I mean, but people, like I was saying about the comparison, the reason why I say it's relevant is because it's the apex fallacy. What they'll say is, well, look, the majority of people on the top 2% are X, Therefore, that X, you know, applies to everyone that happens to fall to that. No, they don't need the slavery argument to make that. Um, oh, they just, they just use patriarchy theory. Well, I know. I compare it to that in the sense because, you know, same sort of argument because what they'll say is, is like, you know, they'll say, well, the top 1%, 1% or 2% of the rich people are men. Yeah. And, They'll use that and say, well, look, that means all men are, you know, better than all women, you know, in society are treated all better than women in societies. You know, and there's a whole bunch of fallacies that that relies on one of one of which um, the most egregious of which is the idea that uh, rich people became rich by by other people's generosity and, and uh, consideration for them and not because they um, they worked for it or uh earned it through brain power or inherited it from from um, parents that worked for it or earned it through brain power, knowing what to invest in and stuff like the the there is no um, detail of men being able to get to the top of the financial food chain that doesn't also apply to women's capability of getting there. Um, so it's that whole argument. I wouldn't even address uh, the apex fallacy before pointing out that you know in order for women to act as though this is a relevant um argument to to their their uh, claim of female oppression they have to prove that women are being prevented from using the same methods that men use to get to the apex yeah and i mean what people they also like you know i was comparing it to the to the, the slavery argument because they're the same exact argument. They're just, you know, instead of, you know, you just replace black for woman or vice versa. And the reason is, is because like, you know, for the, when they go for like, they say white people are all oppressors and stuff like that. They'll, they'll say, well, look, the, the top, you know, the, the, the slave owners were all white. The majority of slave owners were all white. Therefore the average, white person was better than the average black person in every single category. Yeah, there was still poverty. There was still poverty for um, white people even well, during that time. Yeah, and there were people that starved to death too. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the funny thing that they'll just, they'll po they won't point out. They'll say, you know, because they won't compare the lived experiences of very, very poor Southern people 
Southern white people in slaves. Because when you do that, the gaps between the two is actually much less than you would think, sadly. Well, John C. Calhoun used that um, as a pro-slavery argument, in fact. Well, no, uh, it was not he saying... He did, he did. He oh, compared, I... like, the, the very poor white person that was not a slave ended up in the workhouse or um, died in poverty with, with uh, you know, illness and disease and stuff like that. And that was all true. Yeah. And he he his bad leap in logic was because slaves don't have don't die in those conditions, um, their situation is good because yeah. it's better than the situation of the most unfortunate people in society. Um, yeah. The fallacy of it isn't isn't that that it's false that their situation economic situation was better than the people that were worse off the the fallacy in that was that uh, the presumption that um all these people could ever get in life was that that being being black and therefore uh being slaves in america at that time um made them incapable of a- any economic success because they didn't have the capacity to engage in the types of work and um, intellectual pursuits that would gain them that economic success. And that argument was proved incredibly wrong um, over the years after slavery was ended and after the um, uh, civil rights era when we we have seen extreme levels of success among black people who have decided to be entrepreneurs, who have decided to be uh, athletes, great athletes, um, who have created whole areas of music, who, you know, have have invented things and, um, you know, sold them, who have started uh, whole movements that that have led to uh, to social change and so on. So like it's like Calhoun was very short sighted in his argument. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, it, it was an argument that noted that um, the bottom rung of of white society was actually economically lower than slavery. Well, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, here's the argument that I've also, you know, responded to that argument. I said it could be, let's say, hypothetically, this is an imaginary world. Um, let's imagine that all slave masters were benevolent, as benevolent as they could be. They fed their slaves until they were like fat. They gave, they provided their health care immediately on the spot. They did like they treated black people better than their family. They were like the the uh, liberals tell us the U.S. government is. Yeah. So let's assume that was the case. I would say even in that circumstance, slavery is still wrong. Of course, because. You know, because just because a guy is not a sadist when he enslaves someone doesn't mean he's not any more deplorable for for having slaves to begin with. Right. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, so it doesn't sort of make the situation better. I mean, sure, it makes him better than a sadist slave owner, but it, that's not really much of an accomplishment. Exactly. Um, and uh, and honestly, when you compare – if you were going to compare somebody's status to the status of slaves in, in the uh, United States, uh, women wouldn't be comparable to the slaves, but they might be comparable to the slavers. Because uh, if you look at the entitlements that women have, you know, we start out with by virtue of being the bearers of children, we are presumed entitled to – uh, resources that are confiscated by our, our authorities on behalf of the most vulnerable and needy in society. Uh, so when when I made the decision when I was pregnant with my son um, and and uh, when he was little, when I made the decision that I had to get my, my shit together, get my life straightened out and be a financial partner to my husband and a financial supporter of my family – um, I didn't have to do that in the eyes of the people around me to be viewed as a honorable and um, ethical person. I could have been viewed as an honorable and ethical person if I had turned on my husband and demanded that he get his shit more together than any man possibly can 
and you know any person possibly can and support his his ex-wife's household and our family um on his own and nobody would have faulted me for that they should but they wouldn't have if i had chosen to uh just rely on welfare until the kids were all grown nobody would have said well shame on you you should you know do better um because i'm female if i was a man and i did that i would have been um you know treated like a pariah but as a woman i could say well it's you know it's not my ideal situation but i got knocked up you know not i conceived a child with my husband but i got knocked up and then i couldn't get out of the situation and people would not say yes you could have and when i tell people yes you can i get treated like um i'm attacking femininity and women's um sisterhood women's uh uh vulnerability in society and so on and blaming victims uh even though there are, the woman is not a victim in the situation because the re- the situation is a direct result of her own actions you know i also you know funny enough i make satire arguments to show how stupid some of their arguments are about male male accountability how yeah. ch- or, and like i said this it would not surprise me like i made a hy- hypothetical where i said you know where it's a, imagine a liberal newspaper it says man in coma for 10 years, you know, got, you know, was the nurse raped him, stole, you know, got his sperm and impregnated herself with him. Now he's on child support and women would say the man totally, he earned, he deserved that while he's still in a coma. Yeah, they would, they would. Um, I've actually had feminists argue to me, for instance, that, um, boys who are molested by adult women, who have a child support obligation imposed on them by the court are not victims of unfair treatment by the court because uh, they they had an orgasm during the, the rape. Therefore, they consented to her pregnancy. Well, I mean, I like to make that. I mean, that's the same. That's the pro rapist argument on the male side. Yep. And I those- actually have I got uh, part of this conversation um, that we've been in. Uh, like I got flamed for basically pointing that out that they are uh, pro-rape yeah because let's think about it this way and the argument that in some more patriarchal i don't know i wouldn't even say that it's sort of dishonest but in sort of muslim countries they'll make the argument well the woman orgasmed when her when the guy that she said raped her um did that so therefore she wanted it basically it's not rape if she orgasms I mean, well, and that's, that's not really a Muslim argument. It is more of a an ignorant person argument. Uh, like that, uh, that argument's been made here um, too, true. and uh, it's wrong every time, whether the victim's male or female. Um, like I don't, I definitely do not want to get into a that that patriarchy over there habit. Oh uh, yeah, true. But so. I mean, it's true. But I mean, that's why I said it's a bit dishonest because. What people don't realize about Muslim in like pretty much any so-called patriarchal society, whether we're talking about ancient Egypt or current Muslim societies, they are a hierarchical society, a highly hierarchical society where basically here's the thing where they have, you know, everyone sort of has their own caste system where they level at. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing mothers are highly loved yeah infertile and single women eh, maybe not as much but there is a like in ancient egypt for example you'll hear plenty about you know laws that we would honestly think are and probably are sexist yeah women but they'll never tell you i was gonna say there's there's a lot of things that people label sexist against women that they don't know the situation. For instance, like our old coverture laws that um, made the husband responsible or the father responsible for a woman's um, activities and uh, and also her financial welfare uh, and gave the, the man that was responsible for her a level of authority over her in order for him to be able to meet his responsibilities, right? Those are not laws that are specifically sexist 
against women. Those are laws that stemmed out of um, the way society evolved with men being responsible for protecting women and providing for women and everything that in the context of the responsibilities that women expected men to fulfill on women's behalf, those restrictions and rights that men were given made sense. If you're financially responsible for someone, um, then it is it, it is only sensible that you would have control over the finances, the household finances. If you are um, responsible for the debts a person may incur, incur, it is only logical that you should have say over whether or not that person can incur a debt, uh, especially if debtor's prison still exists. And uh, if you're responsible for a crime that a person might could commit, a behavior that a person engages in, um, it's only reasonable that you should have the right to place limitations on that person's freedom of choice in their behavior such that you could control whether or not they committed a crime that you're going to be held responsible for. And when women wanted out of that situation, um, the logical progression should have been, okay, you are no longer restricted to facilitate men's responsibilities for your welfare and your economic success, your economic stability, but men are no longer responsible for you either. And yeah. instead, what feminists fought for was women are not obligated, women are not restricted, right, in, in ways to facilitate men's ability to meet their social and legal responsibilities to women, but men still face those responsibilities. That is what feminists have fought for, and the result has been a decimation, uh, even more than that, because you know, being decimated is when uh, one out of every ten is destroyed. Feminist arguments against male um, rights and female limitations in the facilitation of men's responsibility for women has actually uh, – uh, damaged marriage so badly that more children are, are raised outside of a marriage in a household where there is no marriage than um, by married couples today. You want to know a sad fact? It's really depressing, though. So I warn you. Yeah, well, a lot of things are. A lot of depressed facts are depressing. You know, you know what the fact is. What's that? There's actually more. A per, as percentage wise, there are more black children growing up without their, you know, both their parents than there was during slavery. Yeah. Because yeah. The, the highest that I had seen it go in slavery was it was about about 50 50. Whereas now in some like in black families, it's like 75 percent. Yeah, it's 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 completely destroyed the black family. So let me just get this straight. The, you know, you know, welfare in the modern government has done worse to black families than even slave owners could imagine. Yeah. Well, and it's that it's that combination of welfare and lack of accountability for for women, um, male obligation toward women and lack of female obligation to cooperate with men in their attempts to uphold their responsibilities. Uh, that those obligations place on them. And and it, what you ended up with is a situation where black women kick, kicked black men out of the house, um, kicked them out of the parent-child relationship, and demanded money from them and the government. And the government said, yes, we'll do that. And, and now the family has been destroyed. And we're seeing the same thing with white women. Um, we're seeing the same thing with Hispanic women. Uh, but it hit the black population first and hardest because, because of other other um, uh, legal and economic situations that affected them that didn't um, have the same impact on other people. They were already at a low state as it was. So obviously, like it's like this: poor people are obviously going to be affected by higher taxes than rich well, people. The, yeah, except they weren't all poor. It was just there were limitations. For instance, um, my dad went around uh, as part of a, a census 
effort when um, he was in college. And his his role, he was supposed to help where there was illiteracy because there it, this was back in the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s. And there was there was still a much higher rate of illiteracy in the country than there is today. Uh, so he was there to help um, explain the questions being asked to people who uh, couldn't read or maybe didn't understand all of the terminology and stuff like that. Um, and as he went around accompanying, they went into uh, some lower income neighborhoods. And in those those lower income neighborhoods, there were some households that were obviously much higher income than their neighbors in that, uh, you know, everybody lived in a shanty or a shack or a crappy uh, insulation on the outside instead of siding on the outside kind of a living situation, uh, broken down trailers on on lots where it was obvious they didn't have indoor plumbing and stuff in the in the late 60s, early 70s. Right. But they would have a brand new BMW in the driveway. Um, and one of the things that he learned was this, you know, you go inside the house and you start talking to people and you find out that you don't have to help the people in this house read because they're actually quite literate. Um, the father is a doctor and the mother is a lawyer and the kids are all nicely dressed and the house is clean and the, the, uh, refrigerator is well stocked and everything. And you ask, you know, you got a BMW in the driveway and, and everything here looks very middle class. Why are you living in this shack in this crappy neighborhood? Well, the you know, answer is the bank will give you a loan for a BMW, but refuse you a loan for a house, even though you meet the income standards because you're black. And back then that happened, but not now. Um, it's well, illegal now. So that was one thing that might economically affect people in that situation. You know, and and, I, and it wasn't they weren't living in poverty, um, but they were still forced by the circumstances uh, to live in squalor. But you would have so you have that situation, right? Then your your government comes along and builds a brand spanking new housing project. And in that housing project, you have indoor plumbing, you have uh, nice insulation, you have central heating and air conditioning, you have um, all of the amenities of middle class life, right? And the only thing that is standing in the way of your children being raised there instead of in a shack in a neighborhood full of gangs and high crime is the parents living together and being married. Yeah. So, and then if they live in that neighborhood, they get to go to a better school too. Right. Uh, so now that was at the beginning when, when they just started out, like we're going to uh, build this housing, we're going to um, give people welfare. So on. what do you think is going to happen? Right now in the situation where the mom's a lawyer, she might make too much money for that. But what about the situation where the doctor, it, the husband is a doctor and the wife is a homemaker, right? It might be that they get together and decide, well, you know what? We're going to split up uh, so our children can be raised in a low crime neighborhood in a better set of housing and uh, go to this nicer school. And, of course, not realizing that the next generation is going to be more likely to have a host of problems, including unwed parenthood, uh, welfare dependence, and so on. It becomes a cycle. Um, they, th there were families that made that decision, and and it impacted the black community specifically because, again, like the bank will loan you money for a BMW, but not for a house. Um, you're trapped. The bank will will trap you in that bad neighborhood, and nothing you can do economically will fix the problem except earn so much money that you can pay for a house in cash and even then back then they wouldn't market to you um so it's even though you know over time that low-income housing became a slum and the problems followed the community there and multiplied um that you're looking at a situation where by design the welfare system 
hit the black population first and then the rest of the population in the United States later on like a dirty bomb of social destruction. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, what's funny is, is like, you know, well, when we all go through this, we'll always hear about the great switch that happened between the Republicans and the Democrats. Yeah. And, and I've said, really, I mean, if it depends on how you define it. If by switch, you mean the people that once voted um, Republican now voted Democrats and vice versa. Yeah, that happened. But if you mean the parties fundamentally change their ethics and their the key way that they look at the world, then no, it didn't happen. Yeah, there's a big difference there. Um, and I think part well, of what has happened that uh, has allowed that argument to stand unchallenged when it really should be um, not just challenged but but completely discredited is – People have accepted the idea that um, programs like affirmative action, which uh, engage discrimination that people would consider to be positive discrimination, which isn't really, but that's what that's the way they're they're looking at it. Um, discrimination to quote make up for past discrimination. They're looking at that as an equivalent to anti-discrimination law where the reason a person is hired, fired, promoted, not promoted, and so on cannot be their immutable characteristic, their sex, their race, their religion, and so on. And it is, it's a false premise to accept that, quote, positive discrimination is an equivalent to anti-discriminatory law. Well, I so, mean, it's yeah. like... It's it would be sort of like this argument. In order to make up for past slavery, we're going to allow black people to own white slaves. Yeah, but what I'm what I'm pointing out is, you know, that the um but, the premises so, it the premises, yeah. It's an, an invalid premise and people accepting it has uh led to this belief then that Democrats and Republicans have flipped um, their positions, but that's not true. Republicans have been anti-discrimination all along. Democrats have been pro-discrimination all along. It simply became advantageous to the Democrat Party to switch which group they want to see discriminated against and on behalf of which group. Uh, it's more profitable. They can convince more people to go along with it and keep them in power longer by arguing now that white people should be discriminated against on behalf of black people instead of black people being discriminated against on behalf of white people. Well, can I, can I interject there a little bit? Yeah. Um, the Republican party has all like from its inception has been divided into basically two separate parties within one party where back then you had basically two parties in the original you had mm -hmm. You Lincoln Party, which was the more moderate but still racist party, and you had on the other side the quote unquote radical Republicans who were mostly the abolitionist mm -hmm. and had those group of people. And what people fail to realize is that Lincoln was a moderate. He wasn't. He here's the thing. He well, ne being a moderate didn't necessarily make him racist. See, that's the other thing. Uh, oh. We have a we have a habit in the men's rights movement that really needs to end. Oh, uh, need we're going to lose every time if we don't end it. Um, oh. We need to stop accepting our opponents' premises, and we need to stop accepting centrist arguments. Yeah. Well, so if I somebody says the party of Lincoln was racist, and or the the um the faction of Lincoln was racist, they need to provide proof. That that well that faction was actually racist and actually uh, malevolent. Well, I mean, I mean, if I may interject, I I mean, in history you can never have proof. You can only have the most probable, um, because it's impossible to be a mind reader. Well, that's not necessarily. Um, I don't. I don't think I agree with that necessarily either. You can have proof of things. For instance, well, you can prove uh, who um, who fought slavery and who didn't. You can prove um, who 
well, you can prove where slavery took place. You can prove what um, states did not allow slavery and and what uh, what party was in control of those states. You can prove all kinds of things. You can prove uh, I mean, what the tax system was. You can, like as far I'm, as as far as that goes, you you have all kinds of things that you can prove. Well, I mean, what I mean is in terms of character traits, like, because here's the thing, a person that is, because it, it always relies on the idea that a racist will always behave one way. And that's not true. Well, there's, there's some things, though, that you can prove. Like, if you say somebody was a liar, you, if you prove that they lied, then you have proved that they are a liar. Well, like, I mean. If well, you we, prove that everything they ever said was true, then you have debunked the claim that they were a liar. Well, I mean, you've shown it's more... I mean, but well, that's a characteristic. Well, yeah, I mean, well, here's what I mean by, overall by what I mean by the racist. It's that the person that drafted the amendment that said, you know, slavery was quote-unquote abolished, that person himself, I can't remember his name, but even he said, in a direct quote from him, he said... You know, the Republican Party is the white man's party, and we do not want white labor to be devalued by black slavery. That doesn't necessarily indicate a hatred of black people. What that indicates is uh, that they are a party of uh, supporting an existing um, status quo. And that status quo was that the labor force was limited to, limited to a specific size in terms of paid labor force was limited to a specific size. Um, now, they saw existing black slaves as a competing force that would flood the market and devalue that labor, not because they were black, but because the status at the time of their labor was unpaid. And I don't think it would have been a different thing if they had been – a different white group, if it was the Irish, um, or if it had been women, or if it had been uh, any any other group, um, any any other minority group. Um, well, I'm what they were what they were looking at. Now, of course, because of the language of the time, they did make it a racial statement. But making it a racial statement doesn't prove hatred. Well, I mean, another thing that – another reason why you can really – I mean, because another common idea of it was that abolitionism was a widely popular movement. It wasn't. The well, highest, it doesn't, it doesn't I mean, matter if it was or not. Well, no, I mean, let me talk, tell you. The, the highest that an abolitionist candidate, you know, like a part of the uh, abolitionist party – the highest they ever received in any election, whether it was in the North or South, was 5%. Literally. Okay, but that does not actually make anybody specifically racist. Because, uh, again, the situation was not just a racial situation. It was an economic one as well. So when people voted, they were voting on the basis of the potential economic impact about, of abolition. There were a lot of beliefs about the potential uh, economic impact of abolition that would have been very scary to the people that held those beliefs. They would have ex – they expected widespread poverty and uh, uh, economic impact downturns in, in local economies and such from – to result from the abolition of slavery. And then, of course, in the South, um, they expected uh, a kind of a crash. Uh, and in the North, there the issue wasn't close to home with them, so they were looking at it in terms of expenses versus um, uh, earnings and everything. Uh, so none of it was really like for people to simplify the issue as well. They felt this way because the people who were enslaved were black um, is not looking at the mentality of the people involved. Well, uh, I mean, and this is a time period in which slavery was not the only legal forced labor. And when slavery was abolished, um, I don't think that impacted indentured servitude. 
Technically, it didn't get abolished. It just became, the government just monopolized it with the prison system. True. But uh, when private ownership slavery was ab- abolished, mm-hmm. um, I really don't think that it impacted indentured servitude. There were other laws that had to be passed to affect that. Uh, yeah, but, and, I, but I mean, you also have, like, you know, they also knew that what, because once you because once you made they made a slave like a, a prison loophole what that inevitably led to and it did happen where is that former slave owners like in the south what they simply did is they just became like prison wards and started just rounding up black people well in any case all all of that aside um it goes right back to the argument that the parties have uh flipped yeah, is really based on premises that should be questioned. I mean, yeah, I mean, my whole entire point is that it's not that, like, there weren't good people in it. I'm not saying that. Well, that's I, not what my, my point, that's not what my point is. My, I, my point is when we get told, well, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party flipped, and we accept that argument, we are conceding an argument that is not proved. Oh well, no. I mean, what my point is is that it's the exact. It's not. It's not saying that the parties flipped. It's actually saying the opposite. It's saying that we've romanticized the event so much yeah. that we we have a miscon. Because the thing is, we have this in, this Whiggish interpretation of history where we like to see things between a good a, a battle between good and evil, when there's often a lot of gray in between both. And yeah, there is a lot of gray in between both. For instance, um, if you look at uh, you know the the arguments of the South, um, their argument was a states' rights argument, and that's been flipped in um, in terms of abortion, where people argue against states' rights uh, in order to facilitate a um, an egregious human rights violation against. Uh, against the unborn whereas people argued against states rights during the um uh, emancipation debate in order to facilitate ending an egregious human rights violation against black people well i know this mean like what i'm you know my argument is not that you know my argument is that they didn't flip it's just more or less that the like for the Republican Party, what I'm saying has happened is that what simply happened is that the moderate position back then, which wasn't like the the perfectly non-racist position, that position just simply became the more, you know, it just simply evolved. It didn't change in terms of principles. What happens is, is that it went from being the moderate party versus the radical Republicans is it went from being you know, the, co- the current neo Republicans <laughs> versus the Libertarians in the Republican Party. Yeah, it's hard for me to accept that um, that argument. Just like I, I still am not seeing evidence that, uh, you know, either the modern or the past Republican Party was predominantly racist or, or any such thing. It's just we're accepting too many um, determinations by the uh, left of things as being racist or sexist or classist and stuff like that when they're not. Um, But in any case, like, you know, back to the whole men's issues thing, I never really finished pointing out that like you, you'd asked me about my, my foray into the men's rights movement. Um, Probably the very first thing I did that um, gets kind of recognized as men's rights activism would be going to going to court with a friend of mine who was falsely accused of intimate partner and and, um, sexual violence by his ex-wife in a custody battle. And uh, that case lasted for seven years. And it was it was a case that was based on entirely like no evidence except for the uh, accuser's word. Mm -hmm. Uh, One time she produced a tape that she claimed was him making a prank phone call to her house. And the tape was obviously fake, like to the degree that the 
tone, timbre, and accent were different between the guy that was accused and the voice on the tape. And uh, so my I began writing about that. And um, I wrote about it from the, the standpoint that I was in at the time, which was I was a friend who was just absolutely shocked that the system was so egregiously designed. Um, it was he was a victim of uh, false complaints being filed to the police against him. Um, the police being lied to about him in, in during the investigation, um, being perjured against in court. She testified falsely against him in court um, and being the defendant in a, in a court case where the, um, the, the, beneficiary i guess you could say of the prosecution the accuser got away with acting in contempt of court and um he he had no legal recourse as a victim of these things he could not get the prosecutor to go after her for filing the false complaints for lying to police during an investigation for perjuring herself and even when the judge held her in contempt there was no punishment so for seven years she dragged him through this system and it just got more and more clownish. At one point, he was taken in for questioning on because they didn't call it arrest. They called it taking in for questioning. So they didn't have to read him his rights and they didn't have to respect his rights as a uh, an accused man. Um, and he was held for over the whole weekend uh, on. Well, no, he was held over the weekend on a different time. He was held overnight um, at this at this point, 12 hours uh, on a complaint of a drive-by greeting that never happened and shouldn't have happened under the circumstances and uh it it was just so crazy so i wrote about this on a social media platform called gather.com that is no longer a social media platform my stuff's not up on there anymore um and and she found it the the vexatious litigant found it um during that that time that i was writing about it and uh the, at that point, his side of the case, he had filed against her. He had filed a civil complaint for vexatious litigation. And he had like eight inches of paperwork that that he took into court for this vexatious lis- uh, litigation case. So I was calling her a vexatious litigant in my my blogs, but not by name. I talked about the situation Um, I talked, I didn't name him, didn't name her, didn't name the kid, um, didn't give any case information that would have allowed people to find the case and, uh, read about it. Um, but she showed up, commented, identified herself in the comments under the, the blog posts and then threatened the website with a, um, defamation lawsuit. And they contacted me and they said, this is what's going on. And I was like, shit. You know, um, this woman is a vexatious litigant. If she has threatened to sue you, you have to take that seriously. So if you want to censor the posts, I will take them down and I will reevaluate my writing about this and um, what my goals are in writing about it. And I will someplace other than this site where she cannot uh, go after you guys for it. I will start over again. And that's what I did. I started a google blogger blog called breaking the glasses which uh is written from the standpoint of um eliminating the rose-colored filters through which we view women's actions and i wrote about dealing with restraining order abuse and vexatious litigation as a tactic in custody battles i didn't write specifically about that case i simply gave advice uh, to men in those circumstances, what should they do in that circumstance? And because that completely removed the case from from the discussion, she couldn't make any further threats. And uh, and that blog got noticed. I posted it. I wanted people to see it because I wanted that advice to get to the people that needed it. Um, in particular, false restraining orders are. Uh, really, people don't know how damaging they are. Like, if you're a cop and a woman files a restraining order against you, even if 
you know, you, you like she gets this 30 day temporary restraining order and then you have to go to court and she has to prove that restraining order is a valid request. And if she doesn't, the judge throws it out. Right. But even though the judge throws it out because that 30, 30 day temporary order was in place, you have lost the right to bear arms. Now you can't do your job as a cop and you are no longer allowed to be a cop. If you were a cop for 39 years, right, or or uh, yeah, 39 years, let's say you're a cop for 39 years and you had put in your paperwork to retire and your retirement date was next week and she re- she files for that 30 day temporary restraining order today and and the court clerk, the clerk of courts gives her that restraining order today and the date listed on it is today and you get served during that week you just lost your retirement mm-hmm. right and you're you're now old enough to have a 39 year career behind you and no retirement because you get fired for for losing your right to bear arms you could be a desk sergeant right that, yeah. that no longer works as a beat cop and you just lost your retirement and if 30 days later the judge says this restraining order was never valid you still are out your retirement. You have to fight tooth and nail to get any of that back. And by that time, it's too late. And the level of stress might actually kill you, right? Yeah. So uh, I, the advice that I gave to men, a lot of it was um, in terms of how to fight this kind of behavior and uh, how to handle the types of um, um, tactics that women use this for. And it got notice, noticed in... Um, reddit's men's rights subreddit and uh, like i said because i was posting it there not you know just randomly noticed and uh that got me into a lot of conversations with men in the subreddit who were going through situations like that new people who were going through situations like that or wanted to know how to avoid situations like that and uh and that got me also into conversations with feminists who were very upset at one point, I got accused of telling men how to get away with abusing women. And I, you know, like I got into a huge debate over whether getting out from under a false restraining order constitutes abuse. As if a woman is just entitled to a restraining order because she wants one. And uh, like at the end of that, my, my blog um, got Allison's attention. And... Um, Allison started asking me to write some articles for a voice for men. Ooh. And uh, so I started writing. I wrote about, um, well, I, I think we may have reprinted some of my restraining order abuse stuff. Uh, but I wrote about the gender disparity in criminal court. I wrote about um, a, abuse of men by women and, uh, you know, society throwing abused boys and men under the bus, um, sexual violence against boys and men. Um, accountability, uh, women's lack of understanding of what respect actually is and uh, how how it should be treated and, and how it should be expressed and so on and why. Um, uh, just a bunch of different things. And when Allison wanted to form the Honey Badger Brigade, um, she didn't have a name for the group. Um, we had been talking about a name for the group and, and one of the, she said she wanted to do something with the name Honey Badger because of a conversation that had taken place under a post written by an MRA uh, known as Factory, um, who felt that it was remarkable and important that there were women that would step out into the fray in the men's rights movement and stand between society's ability to say, well, who gives a fuck about you? You're just men. And you're, you're just complaining about this because you hate women. And the men who are trying to say, no, look, we are being impacted by these issues and it is damaging and destroying our lives. Um, and so, uh, and you know, we take a bit of um, abuse that's different from other from other women uh, and and so on. Because you're a traitor, apparently. Right. Because we're gender traitors. So we get kicked out of the sisterhood and, and spit on and that kind of stuff. And and it's, you're we're basically. Yeah, you're basically the female version of Uncle Tom's. Right. And we're supposed to care when they call us that, and we don't. 
So his um, his thing was there needs to be a sort of a descriptive label for that kind of attitude. And, you know, because we don't we don't seem to give a shit when they, you know, when they say stuff like, uh, you know, you should be raped so you would know what it was like, which was said directly to me. Um, and, and it's like, well, that was a dumb argument. You got anything, you know, logical, um, where, you know, a lot of women would be like, oh my gosh, you just made a rape threat. I'm totally traumatized, triggered, you know, um, where, but, but Allison and Karen and I, and a lot of the other women in the movement, uh, are, I guess you could say we're more battle hardened strategic minded instead of you know i don't know strategic isn't the right word because it's very strategic to claim to be triggered when you're not um but yeah we're a little more battle hardened our our skin's a little thicker right mm-hmm. so um oh shoot it was uh dr tara pamantier that actually said well what about honey badgers and she referenced the honey badger video um of um Shoot, like I can't think of his name now either. Uh, by the way, the actor I was trying to think of earlier uh, that played Andy Hardy was Mickey Rooney. Um, uh. But uh, Dr. Tara Pamantier suggested honey badgers in that conversation. So Allison wanted something along with honey badgers as well. Well, at about the same time, we had a smackdown drag out argument, you know, knockdown drag out argument between a voice for men. And Kathy Young over the validity of the men's rights movement. She basically argued that a men's rights movement is not needed um, and is the same thing as a feminist movement. And uh, we we kind of I, I lambasted her in an article that I wrote for A Voice for Men um, anonymously and asked that other honey badgers, you know, and, and people who are interested in um supporting a men's rights movement and not just supporting individual men you know consider signing on to it and a whole bunch I, I thought maybe i'd get like two or three other women that would agree there were a whole bunch of women that signed on with me and so we labeled ourselves the honey badger brigade and um so when allison wanted to start honey badger radio uh, we went with that name, the Honey Badger Brigade, and it's the people involved were all part of the group that signed on to that letter. And uh, so far, you know, we've we've maintained like pretty consistently that same level of attitude and that same um, continuity in in our specific support for uh, men's human rights. And uh, so that's basically how I got involved in the movement. It was this. Like I addressed that case, that seven years in hell case, um, on the basis of my past experiences with discrimination against boys, um, social attitudes toward boys. Like who cares if my my little little boyfriend is wearing a pink shirt just because your girls doesn't mean you own pink moved forward into, gee, if it's true that he can't hit you back because you're a girl – Doesn't that mean that you're picking on somebody who can't hit you back and you're a bully? And, you know, and and then getting to the point where when the Violence Against Women Act was under discussion, I was appalled. I was reading everything I could about it and it looked like a terrible law and I hoped it didn't pass. And then when it did and I started seeing its impact on the guys around me, the seven years in hell case was actually a culmination. And Um, that. You can think about it this way: it's it passed. It didn't just pass like let's say by overwhelmingly Democrats. No. It was bipartisan. It was. That, that's uh, how. And, that's how prevalent gynocentrism is. But a Republican didn't write it. Well, a yeah. Republican and and the Republicans had passed a law prior to that that was gender neutral, um, and it took a shitload of lies. To get the Republicans that signed on to it to sign on to it. And when it was under debate, the people who were raising objections to it were Republicans. And uh, what happened was Joe Biden wrote that law and he's bragged about writing that law numerous times. So um, it's it's obvious that, uh, you know, he really is. He's the writer of the Violence Against Women Act. And uh, 
It's just why it's such a bad law. It was written by an idiot. Spent, like people talk about all the injustices in our system, and I say, yeah. I point, I point out. Here's the the the, sad, the the conscription part, and people like to bring up to me, but don't you know that conscription hasn't been in, allowed in over fifty years or whatever? Well, and it I'm, hasn't been used, but yeah. it doesn't matter whether it's been used or not. I mean that that the only 